To what degree has the coronavirus pandemic interrupted the long-term cycles of the markets? We know that on a day-to-day -day basis, we've had to adjust to new working practices over the last five or six months or so. Where possible, those that have jobs that can be done using the internet are making a good job of the new world that we're in. But there are many that are fearful for the longer term, our children and their futures and how we manage an orderly return to normal, whatever that may now look like. Welcome to this edition of IG Trade in the Markets podcast. I'm Jeremy Naylor. As governments around the world grapple with the black swan event that is COVID-19, are those that follow long term cycles changing their forecast? To what degree are the long term cycles being rewritten? Akhil Patel is Director of Property Share Market Economics, and he's one that follows the long term cycles of these markets. And he joins us now. Akhil, welcome. It's a pleasure Thank to you talk much. to you on this uh, on this platform. Um, I'd like, if I can, first of all, to ask you to um, uh, talk about your work and these long term cycles, because clearly there are a lot of question marks around this now with what's happened recently. But first of all, introduce the topic, because I think it's interesting to get a, a, an understanding of, of what you do. Sure, happy to. So I uh, mainly specialize in a long term uh, economic cycle lasting on average, but with very little variation of 18 years, uh, which is essentially the boom bust cycle that affects all Western economies. Um, and it is fundamentally, while it's an economic cycle, it is fundamentally driven by the land market and what drives uh, it, during each cycle, what drives the economy to the peak is um, a bout of land speculation, uh, which inevitably takes hold after several years of economic growth. Uh, and then you get a major sort of collapse at the end of it, which is the bust phase uh, where the banking system is very uh, negatively affected, as we saw in the most recent episode uh, during the fin global financial crisis uh, that started around 2008. So the question as to how far through that cycle we are, you're suggesting that that was the beginning of the new cycle, the, the great financial crisis, and we're what, some 10 or 12 in years into that? Uh, well, essentially, um, the bust and phase and uh, kind of leads into a recovery phase where, you know, a lot of the uh, credit uh, and leverage of the previous boom has to be unwound. Uh, and that process typically takes about four years to play out if governments are relatively active about it, as they were in the US and the UK um, after 2008. Um, so really, the start of the present cycle was around 2011, 2012. Um, so by that time, you'd had sort of probably the worst of the um, many of the scandals that came out of the global financial crisis, including the LIBOR crisis. Um, uh, the governments had, through their actions, had backstopped uh, the banks, had saved the banks that they felt were worth saving, had managed to ring fence toxic assets and so on. Uh, and so um, if 2011, 2012 is the date of the current cycle, we are uh, pretty much um, eight, eight to nine years into that. So we're at the midpoint of the the current cycle, and so we okay, so have what would you, another few years. So, so, so what what would you expect to see typically mid cycle, excluding coronavirus, excluding the, the the debt crisis that we appear to be in? What would you normally expect to see about this sort of period in that uh, long term eighteen year cycle? Well, it's a really interesting question. So, you typically get a recession at the midpoint. So, you've had several years of expansion. It may not be particularly strong growth, uh, and certainly not. Uh, excessive speculation, certainly in the property market. Um, but, you know, uh, economies tend to require a bit of a pause at the midpoint of the cycle. Uh, and indeed, uh, even before coronavirus became such a dominant issue in our lives, um, you know, towards the end of 2019, uh, you know, economic data was uh, looking rather ropey and, you know, economies were certainly slowing. Um, now, the interesting thing about coronavirus, if we wanted to kind of, you know, get into the idea of that, you know, this has changed everything, um, is that there isn't any cycle in history. And this cycle, you can, we can trace this cycle back to at least 1800 in the US and even a bit further in the UK. There hasn't been any cycle in history where there, where there, has, there hasn't been a feeling that, um, you know, this time is different. There's something very unusual. So if we take um, the previous cycle, the mid cycle was around 2001. Um, you know, we had sort of major terrorist activity, which, you know, pushed the US into 
to recession. Uh, the previous mid-cycle point before that, it was at the early 80s and we had interest rates, you know, approaching 20%. Uh, and, 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 you know, if you go even further back to the mid-cycle uh, of the cycle that culminated with the great uh, Wall Street crash in 1929, the midpoint was in the early 20s. And at that point, uh, we had we were facing a major commodities collapse on top of millions of people dying from the Spanish flu at, in the aftermath of the world uh, the First World War, where, uh, during which millions of people have died. So there's always something um, to make, um, you know, that affects economic events. But the ultimately the cycle uh, continues regardless because ultimately based upon land speculation, and that always um, comes out of a period of economic expansion. <laughs> Just, just talk to us a little bit about uh, this idea about a, a mid-cycle recession. We, we, we are in the midst of a, a recession. We know that. We keep seeing most mm -hmm. days. We, we keep seeing more evidence of the fact that the economies have shrunk by some alarming proportion. Actually, um, how can we measure from where we are here as to where we go from here as to whether or not the recessions are going to get worse whether we go for a double dip how long it's going to last and what's going to pull us out of it what do you what do you say about the recession we're in first of all hmm. i mean it's uh, I, I suppose in a sense this is the unprecedented nature of um uh, the events of this cycle is that you've we've never i don't think as far as i can tell had an episode in history where the government has essentially told the economy to stop working um uh, and you know essentially be the primary cause of the recession um uh, uh but ultimately we've not never we've never had a situation where the government has to a certain extent been able to press the go button and uh, allow um you know actually fairly major sections of the economy to resume activity again uh, usually it's the other way around you sort of get um you know the 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 economy sort of moving into recession and the, the economic problems building up and up and the government doing whatever it can to try and stop it and it not being able to do it and so on. Then we've got, we've got, we've got the inverse of this. Um, I mean, what I would say about uh, whether, how long this will last uh, and what the nature of the recession and so on, I mean, it can be a little difficult to predict the exact nature because every recession brings some new factor in. Um, but it's, uh, according to my research, and this goes back over 200 years, it's the recessions that involve a major collapse in the land market, which then affects the banking system, which are the recessions that are really difficult to get out of. Uh, whereas uh, here, yes, we've had coronavirus. Yes, the, you know, it's still significant sections of the economy are, you know, very much below par. Um, but the uh, ultimately the land market um, uh, and the banking system uh, is not in uh, terrible shape. Uh, and so I don't predict that this recession will last uh, a very long time. It, there'll still nevertheless be no, a number of months still to go and uh, a lot of things will have to be sorted out, including the future of certain industries and, uh, you know, not least the travel and hospitality industry and how that works in a post-COVID-19 world. Um, but, you know, every recession poses a conundrum for an economy and these, these these things are ultimately worked out and then you it sets the scene for the second half of each cycle when you talk about land prices we've just seen recent evidence here in the uk of course that uh, um, house prices are at a record high we've got now uh, the government trying to 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 stimulate that corner of the economy when you talk about land prices what are you referring to specifically here well, uh, I mean, this is, this is a brilliant question. So when people talk about property prices rising, um, really, I mean, it, each each dwelling is a component. It's got two components. It's got a piece of land on which the building sits and then it's got the building itself. Uh, and that's regarded as the property. When property prices rise, it's the land component that is rising in value because location is becoming more valuable. And that's location is what gives land its value. Uh, the building itself is not. Uh, rising in value and indeed uh, as any homeowner knows um after a couple of years you have to start fixing things and you know buildings over time deteriorate and actually in, in a sense lose value uh, so rising property prices means rising land prices uh, and yes when governments um reduce interest rates uh, and invest in infrastructure and stimulate the economy uh, um, it's our thesis and this goes back to the law of economic rent which was first posited by david ricardo and the early 19th century it's ultimately land that takes the surplus of of um, economic stimulus and economic progress <laughs>
uh, and and the reason why the land cycle is so important is because that then draws in capital because you know land speculation is a tremendously lucrative activity at the right time in the cycle uh, and the banking system becomes exposed to that sort of speculative cycle because people you know typically borrow money from banks to invest in real estate ultimately in in rising land prices uh, and that tends to squeeze the economy ultimately so when things have gone too far that then brings about a recession and but then once you once you get that then land prices fall and then you get a lot of issues within the banking system because assets are um are, are falling in value and seriously affecting the bank balance sheets of banks so the the, the recession we've had it doesn't seem to have been accompanied by any drop in land prices are you forecasting a drop in land prices still to come in this mid part of the of this particular long-term cycle no so you typically at the mid cycle you don't get um very significantly falling land prices and the reason is because we haven't in the first half of the cycle had a major period of uh, speculation in you know excessive speculation in land i mean of course you can say well you know property prices in the center of london were far too high and uh, and so on and I, and I totally agree with all, all that sort of thing you see you get localized speculation potentially but it's not a general um it's not a general bout of speculation that you know covers the entire country um and is fueled by bank credits and so uh, at the mid-cycle recession yes the economy does contract uh, land prices may not uh, increase and, and so when i say land i mean property prices may not increase all that much um uh, uh, but they certainly don't uh, fall very significantly the banking system remains in relatively sound shape um and that sets the foundation once you know the time is right for the economy to enter into the second half of the cycle which typically is the more bullish half of the cycle and one of the reasons for that is that the mid-cycle governments historically have always taken uh, significant efforts to stimulate the economy um, and this time is no different uh, and ultimately that will turn things around in, in my view uh, and set things up for the second half. Do you have any insight as uh, to whether we are done with the recession now? We're talking about some sort of economic recovery happening over the next uh, uh, two or three quarters. I know a, a number of economic forecasters and indeed uh, authorities themselves, central banks and so forth, have a slightly more um, hawkish outlook uh, for next year. Uh, d does it concern you as to whether we have a double dip recession? Does it does it matter? Is it something that might be unexpected or do we expect a, a, a second sort of bout of recession in this part of the cycle? Do you think that's normal? Um, it's certainly feasible. I mean, you know, th there's no question that, you know, the the ex the extent of uh, intervention in the economy, firstly, to shut it down and then to try to reopen it has had a major impact on many sectors. And that doesn't uh, get sorted out overnight. And so I would not be surprised if, um, you know, we might have uh, a quarter of growth because, um, you know, as things have started open up, opening up and, you know, uh, as of the start of July, we're really in, you know, fairly, you know, things were fairly slow. And so it's not surprising if July, August and September are growth months. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I would not be surprised if um, we, uh, we then had, um, uh, further contraction if there's a second wave of course and you know parts of the economy are asked to stop working again then you know that would uh, reduce growth um, and you know the adjustments that need to take place in the economy to make it more resilient to a future global pandemic I think will take some months to play out and so you know recession may last uh, for a, you know a number of months uh, longer I mean I would my 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 thinking is probably it won't be before next summer, even the latter half of next year, before we really start to see uh, a return to growth. Um, but okay, as that's, I said that, before, that's, okay, that, that take, taking that um, um, mm -hmm. at, uh, at face value, uh, part mm -hmm. of this recession, of course, um, we, we were it was accompanied by a, a relatively hefty drop in the equity markets. Taking one of the global benchmarks, the um, S and P five hundred, for example, uh, a big wide. Uh, ranging stock market in the States that has uh, a number of companies that represent all sorts of sectors. We know that it has benefited recently from an uptick in interest in, in tech companies that have really shown themselves to be more resilient, perhaps maybe than others during the, the COVID um, issue. Uh, but the market there, I think I'm right in saying we said something like a 35% drop. One of the biggest and fastest 
uh, bear markets. I know that we've had on any of the global benchmarks. It occurred between what I think it was something like uh, around uh, the uh, beginning of February through to the bottom of the 23rd of March, 35% decline. Are you satisfied that we've now seen that retracement? Has that been done? Or do you fear that there could be another pullback in the market, a more meaningful pullback um, coming between now and this time next year when you're suggesting we could potentially be through a possible second round of recession? I mean, again, a good question. So, I mean, I think one of the things that we've started to discover in, um, in kind of in recent months is that the reflection within the stock market of the broader economy isn't sort of perfect. Um, um, and I think to a certain extent, the, the uh, extent and the speed of that fall, uh, you know, it was outright panic in the sort of second half of, of uh, February and the first half of March. Um, I think that panic was uh, largely because no one really knew how governments would respond uh, to uh, to the crisis. Um, and I think, you know, markets feared the worst. Uh, and when they then saw the measures coming into place um, uh, and that certain sectors, as you say, uh, the tech sector in particular, would actually you know, potentially benefit out of um, everyone sort of working from home, um, markets have rebounded strongly. Now, I think, I mean, I, I do also analyze a shorter term cycle, and that's the US presidential cycle. Um, and I mean, you can see that the US government is currently doing as much as it can to, to stimulate the economy, to talk up uh, the fact that interest rates will stay low for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, congressional leaders are um, talking about a, 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 you know, potentially a $2 trillion stimulus package uh, involving investment of infrastructure, which, you know, the US badly needs uh, and so on. I, I don't think that markets will significantly fall this side of the US election. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, post-election sort of bad news then is kind of free to come out. Uh, and I, I, I would be surprised if we didn't see some kind of testing of, um, of the lows. Now, whether markets get back down to the lows of 23rd of March or whether it's just um, is a high low, I, I don't know. I think we'll just have to see how things play out. Um, but I would, I would hazard a guess, uh, given what I said about um, kind of where we are in the cycle at the mid cycle, looking forward to the second half, the second expansionary half of the cycle, that the next low in the markets um, is probably the final low before the, uh, the second half of the, the cycle. And that's certainly the, the kind of forecasts that I've been putting out to my uh, readers at Property Share Market Economics. Yeah, one of the other things is interesting, actually, talking about these cycles and uh, talking about going into the great financial crisis 10, 12 years ago, that of course, interest rates were so much higher than they are at the moment. Now that itself had benefits as well as some drawbacks. Now we've got interest rates at, uh, at record lows. And of course, all this boring that governments have done, the expansion of the balance sheets of central banks and so forth is relatively speaking, costing an awful lot less than it was. What now can the governments and central banks, the authorities do to give that stimulation that I, I think is probably necessary uh, to get us back on the trajectory that you say will take us through the next seven, eight, nine years or so in this second part of the cycle? Or do you think that the markets are in a good enough position and in the right sort of place to be self-funding uh, that uh, expansion that you see over the next uh, uh, seven or eight years or so? I mean, the, the, the massive increase in leverage, I think, will have will ultimately come to hurt uh, the global economy um, that we see, I mean, particularly private sector debt. Um, and so companies leveraging up, uh, taking advantage of low rates and, you know, highly available credit. Um, I, but, you know, it's all in all in good time. So this, I think, will be one of the stories that re we revisit in a few years when we approach the peak of the cycle in terms of what governments do. Um, you know, it, it, there's always kind of two halves of the stimulus story. There's the interest rates or in, probably more accurately, not so much the absolute level, but the direction of interest rates. Uh, and then there's also the fiscal side of things. So it's actually government pumping in money into the economy to pay for infrastructure and for other, um, you know, demand stimulus and so on. Um, I mean, during the financial crisis, yes, interest rates did come down to zero and, and um, you know, central banks did acquire assets off um, of banks and, and, uh, and indeed, indeed, to a certain extent of companies. But really, for me, the, the, the really key moment uh, in all of that uh, was the stimulus packages that uh, the Chinese and the US government uh, put in place, uh, I believe, in, in, in 2008 and 2009. 
uh, which really, um, I think, helped to turn things around. Um, and, and by contrast, uh, and, you know, given that, you know, that's half the global economy, I mean, I think that was very significant effect. By contrast, Eurozone failed to do anything, uh, anything like that um, and relied much more on sort of monetary stimulus and, you know, problems in the Eurozone of, to a certain extent, are still rumbling on. Uh, even now, now where are we now in the in the in the, in in relation to that sort of stimulus story? Well, I mean, I, I, this is the one of the reasons why I think um, uh, we will turn around rather sharply um, into the second half of the cycle. Is yes, coronavirus has resulted in what seems to be an unprecedented recession, but it's also true to say that the volume of fiscal stimulus that governments have created in the aftermath is similarly unprecedented, and that money ultimately ends up. Um, you know, stimulating the economy through investment in infrastructure, for, to keeping demand there, and so therefore businesses uh, alive and so on. Um, and that, I think, ultimately will turn around the economy. And uh, and and what's also quite interesting from our research um, is that at the mid cycle, you always need a new story to have people forget about the previous global financial crisis. Um, so you know, we spent the, the year since 2011, since the start of the present cycle, worrying about the return of the global financial crisis. Uh, and I think in the 2020s, as we get into the second half of the cycle, we won't be talking about that. We'll be talking about how uh, we face down coronavirus and how central bankers and and chancellors and treasury secretaries stimulated the economy, got us through it. Um, uh, and, you know, I think there will be a sense that governments indeed know how to manage the business cycle. Uh, and that gives um, investors a lot more confidence, which drives the cycle to its peak. And something similar happened in 2001. Uh, in fact, in the UK, we had a very famous example of that. Gordon Brown had spent the years between 97 and 2001 telling the world that he would tame the boom bust cycle. Um, and the UK, interestingly, didn't follow the US into recession in 2001. And indeed, for him, this was, uh, I think, confirmation that he did have a handle on how to manage the economy. And of course, we know what happened uh, after that. Mm. Um, I, I wanted to pick up, if I can, as well, on a quote that um, I, I wanted to quote you, actually, uh, in an interview that I did with you on another platform uh, last year. And, and, and at that point, I, I was quite shocked to hear you say this, that um, nonetheless, I, I wanted to, to see whether or not this was still your forecast, that you felt that we were um, going to be given a really big opportunity coming up. We're going to be entering the biggest period of wealth creation ever seen. I think that that quotes you. Um, is that still of your opinion or, or are you still of that opinion or, or do you have have you changed that at all? Um, are you, you're talking about um, some advantages and some some benefits to be seen over the next uh, seven, eight, nine, ten years or so. But are you still standing by this biggest period of wealth creation ever seen? Yes. Yeah, so I have changed my view. I think what I what I thought then in terms of the extent of the boom, I say it's going to be even bigger, um, uh, just you know, simply because the amount of stimulus that has been now been pumped into the global economy is just really quite unprecedented. Um, so yes, we will. I, I do certainly hold to the thesis that it will be the biggest boom of all time, and, and I don't. And I don't mean to say that, by the way, and because I, I, I saw some of the comments on the YouTube feed uh, following that interview. I mean, I don't mean to say that you know, wealth creation will be equally shared and that, you know, there won't be some winners and losers and all of that. But in aggregate terms, yes, I do. I do feel that global wealth um, uh, by the kind of forecast peak of the of the cycle, which will be around 2026. Um, so 18 years after the peak of the previous one um, will be, you know, you know, more than double where it is now. Or where it was. Well, that's, just, um, uh, when I went yeah, that, means, that, that, that interview you referenced was uh, was on YouTube, and that is still on YouTube. But if anybody wants to listen to it, um, under the IG uh, TV uh, subscription channel on YouTube, when I was talking to Akhil Patel uh, last year before COVID nineteen, Akhil, I just want to follow up with one final question, if I can, and that is, what are the risks to your or your suggestions as to where we could be headed over the next uh, several years? I mean, there are there is probably a couple of things. Um, I mean, of course, if you know we we have a series of global pandemics, um, uh, and we are all kind of every year we spend half the year sitting at home, um, you know, I and therefore have much reduced economic activity and so on. Yes, I mean, I do think 
you know, when you don't have market cycles when the economy isn't functioning. So I suppose, um, you know, it's not a given that we'll find a vaccine. And it's not a given that, um, you know, um, you know, well, who knows what the ultimate cause of the current pandemic is. But it's not it's not a given that the regulations around eating of exotic meats and, um, you know, transmission of uh, viruses through the uh, global food chain uh, will will stop. So um, if, you know, if we have that kind of scenario, then. Uh, that will significantly interrupt uh, uh, the cycle. Um, but I, I, I rather suspect that we won't get to that um, kind of point. Uh, I suppose the other the other risk, um, and I mean, this is kind of a left field um, a, a, a kind of feeling at the moment, but it's actually something to watch out given the rising geopolitical tensions. So in, in over 200 years of history, the only things that have um, uh, stopped the cycle were, certainly interrupted the cycle, they haven't actually eliminated it, uh, were the two world wars. Uh, I mentioned the First World War, so there wasn't really much going on in the, you know, the between 1914 and 1918, 1919. Um, uh, but we did get the second half, certainly in the 1920s. I bet, the, you know, the Second World War certainly interrupted the cycle that would have peaked uh, in the 1940s. Uh, and so, uh, and so if we had something along those lines, um, you certainly wouldn't uh, have the repeat of the cycle as I'm forecasting. But other than that, um, you know, it's not to say that economic events don't arise that make things occur differently to, you know, what was perceived to be normal uh, previously. But that's always the case throughout economic history. Um, and the cycle repeats regardless. So I don't really see there being too much that would stop the cycle repeating. Of course, there's going to be lots of risks as an investor from all uh, range of uh, of um, uh, different uh, sources. That's part of being an investor and doing proper due diligence and so on. Interesting stuff, Akil. Look, I'm, I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you so much indeed for joining us there on today's edition of IG Trade in the Markets podcast. That's Akil Patel. He's Director of Property Share Market Economics, and you can find out more about Akil's work and his team at www.propertysharemarketeconomics.com.